right now, and so he'll be back and forth a little bit. Um, but we want to go ahead and get uh, begin this time as well. The committee will come to order. We exist, the Oversight and Government Reform uh, Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. Second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to the taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will also work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. As a nation, we have certain values that characterize us. We believe that each person has been endowed by their Creator with certain rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are not rights given by men or confined to national boundary. They are unique to each person worldwide. That passion for freedom and our national security has taken us across the globe. In the process of doing the right thing, we must also be careful to do it the right way. At the height of our overseas contingency operations, we had hundreds of thousands of military personnel stationed overseas. While we have our differences in opinion on the current strategy or the way forward, we must remember there are tens of thousands of American men and women stationed abroad, and regardless of whether there are tens or hundreds or thousands of troops abroad, the support personnel required to ensure these military and diplomatic operations are effective continue to remain. Within the confusing maze of contractors and subcontractors who support our operations, there appear to be a less than reputable foreign companies that engage labor brokers who apparently are accountable to no one. They exploit unskilled workers from impoverished backgrounds. We hold these we are told that these workers are taken advantage of in their unconsciously low wages, in their work expectations, and in their living conditions. The purpose of this hearing is to stop ask the questions that will confirm or deny these, these accusations. These foreign workers are known as third country nationals, or TCNs. They are the workers who tend to the gardens, wash the dishes, prepare, prepare fast food meals, do the laundry for American embassy workers or military personnel stationed in the Middle East, Iraq and Afghanistan. They come from countries such as India, Nepal, Bosnia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and the Philippines. They provide what the military calls base support operations, or they are used by embassies throughout the Middle East to perform the menial labor necessary to support embassy operations. According to various accounts, some of these workers have been robbed of wages, injured without compensation, subjected to sexual assault, or held in deplorable living resembling indentured servitude by their subcontractor bosses. Many have paid an illegal job broker fee equal to or greater than their final pay. Reports have suggested they are deceived about their work location or conditions when they are recruited. This can best be characterized as involuntary servitude or even labor bondage for the victimized workers. These unsavory labor practices are collectively called trafficking in persons. It is prohibited by the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, which establishes minimum standards for eliminating trafficking in persons around the world. In fact, the United States has numerous laws, policies and contractor regulations already on the books to prevent human trafficking. The purpose of this hearing is to explore whether the United States, through its unprecedented use of contractors in war zones and contingency environments, has become an enabler of human trafficking or if we have knowingly turned a blind eye to trafficking. We also want to examine the role of contractors and their subcontractors in adopting these abhorrent labor practices. If our nation is trafficking in persons, we must stop this practice immediately. Apply every option with abusive contractors, including suspension, debarment or prosecution, and take the appropriate steps to impose the law. This is not a case where clear law is lacking. It seems to be a case where enforcement is lacking. To examine the facts, we have two panels today. The first panel combines investigative journalists, a lawyer specializing in human trafficking concerns, and experts from Congressional Research Service to describe the problem in more detail. The second panel consists of representatives from the Inspector General's offices of the State Department, the Department of Defense, as well as representatives from the Department of Defense Human Trafficking Office and the Army Air Force Exchange Service to recount their experiences with human trafficking issues and to offer some insight into what they are doing to prevent American taxpayer money from supporting these practices. I look forward to receiving some clarity and answers on this issue. There is no good explanation of why we would still have contractors using illegal recruiting fees, providing inadequate living conditions for TCNs, or violating a multitude of other clear human dignity values. With that, I would like to recognize Mr. Connolly for his opening statement. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I agree with you that uh, this is a matter of enforcement. This is a matter of values. There is nothing more abhorrent than taking away human autonomy. Uh, human trafficking is unacceptable under any circumstances. War does not justify it. Uh, the mission doesn't justify it. We cannot and will not turn a blind eye to this practice. And as far as I am concerned, and I think eventually this Congress, uh, Federal agencies will be held responsible. Prime contractors will be held responsible uh, when and if this practice occurs. Um, it needs to be rooted out, stamped out, and ended. Uh, that is as fundamental an American value and a human rights value as exists on this planet. Uh, I am glad you are holding this hearing today, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working with you on a bipartisan basis uh, to make sure we end this abhorrent practice. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record. We will now welcome our first panel. Ms. Uh, Weiler is a senior analyst for the Congressional Research Service. Mr. Eisenberg is an independent analyst and writer specializing in issues involving wartime contingency operations. Uh, Mr. Nick Schwellenbach is the chief invest uh, investigator of the Project for Government Oversight. And uh, Mr. Sam Mc Mc McCann, McCann. McCann, which one? McCann, thank you, is an attorney in private practice and founder of the McCann Law, Law Firm. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Would you please rise and raise your right hands? You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you, God. Let the record reflect the witnesses have answered in their affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Uh, your entire written statement will, of course, be made part of the record. Uh, Ms. Weiler, you are first up. Uh, we would be honored to be able to receive your testimony at this time. Thank you. Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Connolly, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today before you on behalf of the Congressional Research Service. My testimony will discuss U.S. policies and efforts to combat international human trafficking among contractors working overseas and representing the U.S. government. Trafficking in persons has been an issue of concern to the U.S. and international policy community for its human rights implications and as a prolific form of transnational criminal activity. Despite international commitments to eradicate human trafficking, recent reports suggest that the United States continues to face challenges in preventing it and related violations in the per performance of Federal contracts overseas. These challenges are not new. Since at least the late 1990s, U.S. contractors have been implicated in allegations of human trafficking and related violations in Bosnia, South Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other countries around the world. These allegations have been of concern to policymakers because they risk tarnishing the reputation of the United States as a country that stands for freedom and human rights principles. They may also undermine U.S. diplomatic efforts to galvanize international support to combat human trafficking. In response to many of the allegations that have surfaced over the years, the U.S. government has sought to prevent human trafficking in the context of a multi-tiered policy framework. This framework consists of international treaties, federal statutes, policy directives, implementing regulations, <laughs> agency-specific policy guidance, and voluntary best practices. In their current form, U.S. anti-trafficking <laughs> policies provide for a common definition of severe forms of human trafficking and related offenses. As of December 2002, the U.S. government also established a zero-tolerance policy against such trafficking, which applies to contractors. The centerpiece legislation for the U.S. efforts to combat human trafficking is the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, known as the TVPA, as well as its three reauthorizations. The TVPA emphasizes a three-pronged policy approach to anti-trafficking that focuses on preventing human trafficking, protecting trafficking victims, and prosecuting traffickers. The TVPA, as amended, also contains provisions designed to prevent human trafficking in Federal contracts. Specifically, the TVPA's 2003 reauthorization allows contracts and subcontracts to be terminated without penalty under certain conditions. 
These include situations in which a contractor engages in severe forms of human trafficking, procures a commercial sex act during the contract period, or uses forced labor in the performance of the contract. Implementing regulations require that contractors insert an anti-human trafficking clause into all solicitations and contracts. This clause covers, among other provisions, how to address violations, including the application of suitable remedies, such as termination, suspension, and debarment. Additional executive branch regulations apply to certain contracts in Afghanistan and Iraq. For example, the US Central Command's Joint Theater Support Contracting Command mandates additional provisions related to employee passports, recruiting fees, and living conditions, among others. Yet, despite this multi-tiered policy and implementation framework, allegations of trafficking violations and contracting practices that heighten the risk of trafficking appear to continue to take place. The US Commission on Wartime Contracting has highlighted possible incidents related to human trafficking involving labor brokers, contractors, and subcontractors in U.S. contingency operations overseas. Several reports by U.S. Inspectors General offices have also, in recent years, identified problematic contracting practices overseas that raise the risk of human trafficking and related violations. Some observers have begun to wonder why, after decades of strengthening U.S. and international policy against human trafficking, do such violations continue to occur? Is the existing legal or regulatory framework sufficient? Are there gaps in the oversight and enforcement of existing laws and regulations among overseas contractors? Do contractors and subcontractors, as well as those responsible for monitoring them, understand what actions are prohibited and how such contracts should be monitored? And to what extent are continued trafficking violations in contracts overseas a manifestation of broader challenges associated with managing and relying on a large contractor force to support overseas missions? These questions may warrant further exploration by policymakers and implementing agencies. This concludes my testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Mr. Eisenberg. Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Connolly, other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I commend you for examining the issue of whether government contractors exploit workers overseas. It is unquestionably a problem, but it has come up elsewhere. It has yet, not yet received the sustained attention it merits. The Commission on Wartime contracted contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan noted in its final report U.S. contingency contractors opportunistic labor brokers and international criminal organizations have taken advantage of the easy flow of people, money, goods, and services to capitalize on the sources of revenue and profit. Their actions bring discredit to the United States and act as a barrier to building good diplomatic relations. This subject also means you have to look at the relationship between prime contractors and their subcontractors, which is another linked problem. It is often to cite Winston Churchill, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. As proof of this, you, have to, you don't have to look any further than last week when the International Stability Operations Association, a major trade association for an industry, held their annual summit. One of their workshops was entitled Performance and Pitfalls of Subcontract Management. <coughs> I'm pleased to be here to discuss the Najwa episode revisited report that I co-authored with my colleague Nick Schwalmbach of POGO which came out earlier this year. In interest, full disclosure, I should mention, though I fully uh, commend POGO for allowing me to uh, come to them with the information and in publishing the report. I don't speak for POGO. Uh, first, let me address why is this important. For years, industry advocates have been claiming that thanks to private military and security contractors, U.S. military forces had the best supplied military in any military operation in history. It's true that PMCs are now so intertwined and critical that the U.S. military simply can't operate without them, but it is not an unmitigated benefit. Many PMCs have problems implementing contracts. Some have committed outright fraud, as you know, thus wasting U.S. taxpayers' monies and indirectly negatively affecting U.S. military operations. Second, our report documented various violations of the law and irregularities which with regard to third country nationals. Some people may say this is unfortunate, but since nobody was wounded or killed, what's the big deal? The answer is twofold. 
First, as any competent military commander will tell you, wars are not fought and won by machine and tools. They are fought and won by people. Given how tightly integrated private military contractors are with regular military forces treating people badly on the private side can adversely impact people on the public side. Secondly, there is a cost when contractors are improperly used and treated, and I am not talking about money. Although it is not widely recognized, the use of private contractors among the complex of national defense, security and foreign, depart foreign policy departments and agencies is so widespread and so wide in scope that their impact can be strategic as opposed to merely operational and tactical. If you think I am exaggerating, consider the recent news that the U.S. is withdrawing its military forces from Iraq by the end of the year. This was not done because the Obama administration wanted to do so. It was done because it could not work out a deal regarding immunity for U.S. military forces. But given the events of September 2007, when Blackwater security contractors shot and killed 17 Iraqi civilians, no Iraqi government was ever going to be able to grant an immunity deal. Now, like it or not, that strategic impact. In other words, there is a reputational cost when contractors do bad things or are treated badly. Third, while industry officials and advocates say they often welcome regulation and it often comes with a caveat that it should not be intrusive or burdensome, they note they often they already comply with existing laws. While it is true that existing regulation could interfere with the proper functioning of the private sector, it is equally true that the unconstrained activities in the marketplace, especially in the chaos of battlefields and war zones, is a recipe for problems. In the truth, free market and regulation can go together. Finally, contractor advocates also point to their own efforts to ensure ethical conduct, notably through codes of conduct. While this is commendable and perhaps someday uh, even useful, it is hardly sufficient. At the present time, uh, their mechanisms are, for enforcement are largely theoretical and not resourced, and uh, there are no people or money put behind them. Right now, they operate on the Joe Isuzu principle, which is to trust us. My response is that we should heed the words of Ronald Reagan and trust but verify. Uh, finally, even if a company does have high standards uh, for ensuring ethical conduct, it all falls, falls apart when it comes to subcontractors. KBR had a lot of, uh, has an extensive code of conduct, has a lot of resources it puts into implementing behavior for its employees. But when it came to dealing with its own subcontractor, it failed miserably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Os Osberg. Look forward to receiving questions as well. Mr. Swollenbach. Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Connolly, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. The U.S. has been a global leader in combating trafficking in persons, yet our tax dollars are inadvertently fueling this human rights tragedy through our overseas contract labor supply chain. Not only is trafficking and exploitation of laborers a moral wrong, but it can spark a backlash from the laborers and their home countries and could undermine the U.S. mission abroad. There have been some oversight improvements over the last several years, but there is a lack of enforcement. For example, to date, there have been no prosecutions for contractor-driven war zone trafficking. First, I will recount some stories of laborers in Iraq, then I will summarize public reporting of U.S. investigative and enforcement activity. Third, I will recommend some ways to strengthen enforcement. In June, The New Yorker's Sarah Stillman reported on labor rights abuses against third country nationals on U.S. contracts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and she focused on the stories of two Fijian women, Vinnie Tuvaga and Lydia Cuerounu, and I may be mispronouncing their names, uh, who worked for the Army Air Force Exchange Service subcontractors in Iraq. Vinnie and Lydia were, like many others, lured by promises of good pay. They were told by a local recruitment firm in Fiji that they could each make between $1,500 and $3,800 a month in Dubai, in the UAE. After arriving in Dubai, they and other women discovered their true destination, which was Iraq. They could have quit, but they had gone into massive debt to pay the recruitment fees to be there. Quitting would mean no income to pay off this debt. But when they got to Iraq, Vinny and Lydia and the other women further discovered that instead of making between $1,500 and $3,800 a month as they were promised, they would only make $700 a month, which was later further reduced to $350 a month. The contract they signed specified that they would work 12 hours a day for seven days a week and that their vacation was a return ticket home. In addition, an APHIS subcontractor supervisor had been repeatedly sexually assaulting Lydia, according to the New Yorker article. 
The allegations eventually ended up in the hands of both APHIS officials and the Army Criminal Investigation Command. Army CID told me last year when I was working on another article that they did not substantiate the allegations of trafficking and sexual assault. They would not tell me if they had actually interviewed the women. According to The New Yorker, Lydia and Vinnie both say that no one from the military or APHIS spoke to them about their sexual assault claims. In another case from 2004, several Nepali laborers believed that they would be working in a five-star hotel in Jordan. Cementing that belief was paper, paperwork filed with Nepal's labor ministry for several laborers to work at that hotel. The recruiting fee charged each laborer meant that they and their families were deeply in debt, but the promises of lucrative pay made the debt seem like a good deal. Furthermore, the manager of the recruitment firm told the Chicago Tribune that he didn't mention anything about Iraq to the applicants. They believed they were going to Jordan. But after they arrived, the Jordanian brokers demanded that the Mpali surrender two months' pay as a fee, in addition to the recruitment fee, and accept less than half the salaries promised them in Nepal, and that they go to Iraq. According to the Tribune, their families told them that they must go to Iraq to cover the loans used to pay a Nepalese broker $3,500 for each man more than a decade of earnings for the average Nepali laborer. The Amman to Baghdad Highway, which runs through Iraq's Anbar province, is dangerous even for convoys guarded by security details. But 12 Nepali laborers did not have the advantages of having a security detail. They traveled this route, were kidnapped by insurgents, held for weeks, and killed. I'll skip an example. Uh, Looking at overall enforcement activity over the last several years, there have been a few investigations. But there were no DOD investigations into trafficking in both 2006 and 2007, according to the DOJ. The section detailing DOD investigations is missing in 2008 and 2009 reports. In 2009, according to the DOD IG, there was one report of a preliminary investigative activity of a contractor in Iraq for labor trafficking, but prosecutors determined facts and circumstances did not warrant further action. Over at the State Department, two investigations were opened in 2009 and closed in 2010. A State Department IG spokesman told me last year, he said both cases were unsubstantiated. So there have been a few investigations, but so far none of them have led to prosecutions. There was also a civil action where the DOJ joined a whistleblower lawsuit earlier this year, and the company settled to, uh, quote, uh, in, the, in the litigation. Uh, but what can be done to improve enforcement? Investigators clearly need the resources they, uh, that they require. The SIGOCO or Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingency Operations may be one way to do this. They also need to be trained in investigating trafficking and persons violations. And uh, jurisdictional ambiguity should be closed with the Civilian Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. Thank you for, for, for this opportunity. I'm open to questioning. Thank you, Mr. Schwalbach. Mr. McConnell. Chairman Langford. Ranking Member Connolly, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today, and thank you for taking an interest in the practice of modern-day slavery on government contracts, and thank you for your commitment to take decisive action in this area. I lived approximately nine and a half years in the Gulf region, Kuwait, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Trafficking in persons is not a unique phenomena to government contracts. It is par for the course in these countries, which is why the Department of State ranks them as on Tier 2 and Tier 3 for trafficking countries. In support of our trafficking countermeasures, my colleagues Sindhu, PK, and I have collectively spoken with several thousand victims of trafficking on government contracts, both in Iraq and back in South India. As an attorney who has spent a significant portion of my career investigating allegations of procurement fraud on behalf of the U.S. government and corporations, I look forward to talking to you today about the dynamics of trafficking in persons on government contracts performed in contentious areas. I would like to focus and summarize three areas. The first, I will describe the common schemes used by contractors and recruiters to exploit workers, reduce them to the status of indentured servants. Second, briefly describe the scope of trafficking on U.S. government contractors and the inadequacy of the government efforts to date. And finally, touch upon some mitigation measures that can be taken by the government to abolish this practice. Although there are many companies engaged in trafficking on U.S. government contracts in Afghanistan and Iraq, they use a tried and tested business model to perpetrate the fraud. Following steps are standard operating procedure for the traffickers and also the subcontractors and prime contractors who take kickbacks from the traffickers. <coughs> 
First, subcontractor prime contractor establishes a direct contract with the recruiting company in the developing nation. The purpose of the personal contact by the subcontractor or prime is to solidify the kickback scheme. Second, arrangements are made for the contractor company to pay the recruiter for the services of recruiting, such as airfare, visas, cost of medical examinations. Third, the contractor and the recruiter agree to the amount of the kickback paid to the contractor for giving the recruiting firm the business. Kickback is typically 50 percent of the money charged by the recruiter to the prospective employee. This is where the violation of the Anti-Kickback Act of 1986 occurs. Fourth, the recruiter trains, retains the services of subagents to solicit victims. This process facilitates the layering or onion skin effect in order to provide plausible deniability up the trafficking chain. Fifth, the recruiter will solicit victims from farming villages who are typically without resources. This category of victim is also less sophisticated concerning the fraudulent techniques used by recruiters. Sixth, the recruiter deceives the victim into believing that he will receive money far beyond which he will actually earn. Oftentimes, but not always, the location of the work site is misrepresented. Seventh step, the recruiting, recruiter's agent informs the victim that he will need to pay a fee between $2,500 and $5,000 in order to get the well-paying job and good working conditions servicing the U.S. government. This action induces the victim to pay the high recruiting fee and will help ensure future compliance with the contractor's dictates because the victim will become indebted in order to pay the commission to the recruiter. Eight, victims will typically obtain the money from a loan shark or use their house or their dowry gold as collateral. The interest on the loan is between 35 and 45 percent. The money paid to loan shark must be provided to the recruiter or subagent prior to departure for the work site. Workers are not provided a written contract prior to the departure from their host nation. If they do receive an agreement once they arrive at the work site, it will not be written in a language they can understand. Tenth phase, once the victim arrives in the combat zone, he is typically housed for several months without pay and not permitted to call his family. When he does receive the first work and pay is typically 50 percent of what he was promised by the recruiter. He tells his employer what was promised by the recruiter, but the subcontractor prime informs him that is a matter between the worker and the recruiter. By this time, the worker has missed monthly payments to Loan Shark. He now pays approximately 50 to 75 percent of his monthly wages just to service the interest on the loan. Even though he knows he was deceived, he is helpless. If he speaks to anyone with the government, he is terminated immediately and sent home. Often we found that the prime contractor instructs the employees that they are not allowed to inquire report trafficking conditions of subcontractors, thereby completing the conspiracy of science and mitigating detection of the crime. In response to the vocal question of this committee, about the effectiveness of the Trafficking of Persons Act on the process on contingency contracts, it has not had any deterrent effect. Several mitigation measures can be taken. I will be glad to address those in the questions. And thank you for the time to speak. Thank you for your testimony. And I recognize myself. I am going to do six minute question rounds. You okay with that? There you go. We just settled it. Um, th th this is one of those moments when you think, okay, where do we start? All right, let, let me begin here. Do you feel like, and anyone can answer this, that we have the right policies and regulations in place? Because this is not some new feature that we have never heard of. This has gone on now 20 years. Uh, all the way back to Bosnia, they were very aware that this has slipped into our subcontracting and contracting process for overseas contingencies. At this point, we have added new laws, added new regulations, added new policies, added new procedures over and over again, added new officers and lead in it, yet we still have stories of this occurring. Do we have the right policies and procedures and regulations in place in your perspective? And anyone can answer that at this point. You go ahead. Chairman Langford, members of the committee, I, I do believe we have the right regulations in place. The problem is transparency and reporting. There are not enough agents on the ground to report this conduct. It has to be the responsibility of the prime contractor. But now the prime contractor has no incentive and all the disincentive in the world to report the conduct. It makes the prime contractor look bad if they do report it, and they get no incentive for engaging in reporting. Okay. Yeah, let me, I'm going to come back to that. Anyone else have another comment to add to that? Mr. Eisenberg. Mr. Chairman, I believe that the right policies are in place, but I believe that some of those policies and regulations are rarely used in part due to opposition from the industry. For example, uh, 
major trade associations. I have in mind the Professional Services Council and the International Stability Operations Association, to name two, uh, have been quite valuable in their opposition to the government using its powers of suspension and debarment against contractors who do wrong things. But do we have suspension and debarment being applied to people that are doing human trafficking? If we are aware that is happening on the ground, do we know of a case that a contractor is suspended or debarred? There was um, one State Department embassy subcontractor, I believe in Jordan or somewhere else in the Levant, that was terminated earlier this year, according to State Department Office of Inspector General report, after uh, uh, the contracting officer discovered that there was a violation of the FAR for uh, uh, prostitution. Apparently, one of the employees was being solicited by a manager of the subcontractor. Okay. So one? That's all I know. As of. far as we know, at this point, I mean, for, for a a policy that is turned the as Ms. Weiler referenced earlier, and it's come up again, and again, and again, the zero tolerance policy for this. Why is it that I talk to soldiers coming back and ask them what it was like in the wire, and they tell me stories about TCNs over and over again, and their abusive living conditions, in the uh, the way that they're treated on the ground, the recruiter fees, how they're trying to get out, they can't get home. I mean, that, those are the stories that I hear from soldiers when they begin to tell me about what was happening on the ground while they are in Afghanistan. Those are the reports that continue to come back. So if we have the right regulations in place, we have a zero tolerance policy, we have the options in the toolbox of suspension and debarment, what is holding us back to actually enforcing this on contractors and subcontractors so we can make this stop? I will weigh in here. I, I co completely agree with my co-panelists here. And while I think there are some tweaks to law and regulation that, that would be beneficial, such as uh, clearing up any ambiguity about U.S. jurisdiction over non-DOD contractors in overseas contingency operations, I think the biggest problem is commitment to enforcement of the laws and regulations on the books. Um, you know, I, I didn't get to it in my oral, but in my written testimony, I recount the example of the, uh, the, the Nepali laborers who were killed in uh, Iraq on the Amman to Baghdad Highway. Um, Attorney Martina Vandenberg, several years ago before a Senate subcommittee, remarked that the DODIG, and this was several years ago, keep in mind, um, seemed to confuse the principles of civil and criminal law. And the IG said, well, we couldn't go after the subcontractor because there was no privity of contract between the U.S. government and the subcontractor. But this was a criminal matter, and according to the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, uh, the, you know, criminal uh, jurisdiction extends to all tiers of subcontracting. Right. Um, so if the remarks by the, the then acting DOD IG uh, were correct, they were totally confused. Let, let, me, let me clarify this as well. Do you, do you have a perspective on what is an appropriate recruiting fee or these broker fees at this point? For someone to pay a $2,500 to $5,000 broker fee to someone in a very poor country uh, and then they go and they work and they receive less than that, than what they paid, th that is difficult not to define that as slavery. That is that, very difficult not to say this is not some sort of debt bondage that we put you in $5,000 worth of debt and if you work for us for a year, you will get your $5,000 back, maybe, unless you mess up or report what is going on and then you will get way less than that and we will send you home. Uh, is there an appropriate level you would say that is a recruiter fee? Chairman Langford, I, I think that, Chairman Langford, I believe that there is an appropriate recruiting fee. It is defined by the host nations. All of these nations that produce foreign labor have their own laws. Some say a specific amount, like Kenya, maybe $275. Others will limit it to one month of the, of the salary as a maximum recruiting fee for foreign laborers, which also creates a conflict within the U.S. government contracts, which say that the contractor is abiding by all the laws of the host nation right. wherever they are performing. But and, not, not having to pay for their travel, their flight, their, all that stuff in transitioning, that is not an appropriate level. That's I mean, obviously, that should be paid for in the contract. Okay. And in, in many of the countries, Mr. Chairman, for instance, Kuwait mandates that the employer pay for those fees right. and the housing, the transportation over. Someone, when we are going through the contract, we are aware of what it costs to move people into the country, what it costs for travel, what it costs for labor. So at some point we can say this is out there, someone, we are not tracking it. But someone signed off on this contract with the details within it of what that money would pay for. So either that money is being skimmed off completely by an unscrupulous contractor or we are aware this is going on, but it can't, be, it can't be none of the above on that. So with that, I would like to yield to Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as I said in my opening statement, I, taking away human autonomy is 
perhaps the most abhorrent crime imaginable. Uh, and uh, it occurs with murder and it occurs with human trafficking. Uh, what you have described is a process of, at the most charitable phrase, indentured servitude. Uh, and that is being charitable. Uh, Ms. Weiler, you noted that the 2003 TVPA directed agencies to cease contracting with firms that engage in human trafficking or which sexually abuse their employees. Is it correct that not a single case of trafficking or sexual assault has been prosecuted under this statute or the 19 other laws, executive orders, and DOD memos banning such trafficking and abuses? Representative Conley, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, issues related to the U.S. criminal justice system and the status of prosecutions in U.S. courts are beyond the scope of my expertise. And I'm, but I'm happy to share your question with my colleagues in the American law. Are you aware, Ms. Weiler, of a single prosecution? As far as I know, according to the State Department's last two reports, uh, there have not been uh, prosecutions. Right. Mr. McMahon, why? Uh, one thing I gleaned from your testimony, if I can interrupt, we have created a system of disincentive for reporting. The prime contractor gets dinged if he is diligent and says, you know, I have encountered a case here, I think we need to pursue it. He actually loses if he does that, if I understood your testimony. I believe, I believe that is correct. Mm -hmm. Sir. I do believe that is correct. Right now there is no mandate to report it, and if they do report the misconduct, it has a negative reflection upon them. To date, the only thing we have seen reported is when there has been such overwhelming attention to a given issue, as identified in The New Yorker and by POGO, that the prime contractor will take action. And if I might respond to the Chairman's question, I think one of the problems why there is no suspension debarment is people don't understand suspension debarment. I was a trial attorney for the Army's Procurement Fraud Division suspension debarment branch. Suspension debarment branch is not a criminal or civil matter. It is a business decision by preponderance of the evidence whereby the official makes a determination, we don't want to do business with this company. And right. it is more likely than not they engage in the But all, again, a disincentive. If I am a private contractor, does debarment and suspension are not desirable goals. That is correct. So why would I want to risk that? And it seems to me we have got the wrong set of incentives and disincentives in place if we want to really deal with this. Now, I, I, I asked Ms. Weiler, I may be the wrong person to ask, but I am unaware of a single case being prosecuted. Are you, Mr. McMahon? I am not aware of a single case, nor am I aware of any suspension debarment. All right. So, so that must mean that our zero tolerance policy is working. Is that correct? <laughs> I believe it is a zero tolerance policy in reporting uh, the conduct. Well, Mr. Schwellenbach and Mr. McMahon, uh, we are talking about some very isolated examples then, right? This is not a, this is not a widespread practice. We are not talking about a lot of people, are we? My understanding is this could potentially impact thousands of laborers. I mean, the, the, the exact percentage of the third country national workforce that is uh, subjected to these kind of labor practices is quite large, although I am not sure if it is the majority or not. Sam might be more uh, uh, prepared to answer that. Time is limited. Would you concur it is thousands? I would say tens to hundreds of thousands. Dear Lord. Of okay, my goodness. So it is not, a, it's not some isolated random practice. We are aware of it. We have a zero tolerance pro policy. We have got 19 laws, executive orders, and DOD memos making it very clear we frown on this practice. We won't tolerate it if it is ever uncovered. But fortunately, it has never been uncovered, at least not rising to the level of a single prosecution. Is that correct? That is correct. <sighs> well, then I guess I would ask, how, these are all contractors or subcontractors serving the United States government? Yes. We are talking about? Yes. So to what do you ascribe the apparent indifference of the United States government and its prime and subprime contractors with respect to this abhorrent practice? 
Well, in regards to suspension and debarments, uh, government agencies are often loath to suspend or debar or debar a contractor or subcontractor unless there is some sort of successful civil action or criminal prosecution. And so it becomes this kind of uh, catch-22 situation. Well, there is no prosecution or conviction or civil action, so we can't suspend or debar. And that is a misunderstanding of the suspension and debarment practice. As Sam mentioned, they can do what are called fact-based debarments to protect the interests of the U.S. government if they can successfully document noncompliance with U.S. Uh, federal acquisition regulations. But, but we are in the system that protects itself. Exactly. Not the victims. Absolutely. Not human beings whose autonomy is being lost or compromised because I guess it is inconvenient or, I mean, what, what, other than bureaucratically debarment and suspension are messy and complicated and people don't like them. But I mean, your testimony is it could be tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of individuals we are talking about in this victim pool serving the United States government and its prime contractors. And we have not had a, to our knowledge, this panel, not a single prosecution. The laws are all in place. The uh, policies are all in place. We got zero tolerance. And what that system has produced is zero reporting. Zero, not pro zero prosecutions. Zero prosecution. And there have been cases that have been presented to prosecutors, but they have declined to prosecute. At least two that I know of. Yes, I believe I believe uh, Nick is correct, Representative Connolly. There was one case in 2009, one case in 2010, when the DoD IG surveyed all the four federal law enforcement agencies on the ground, and they reported one case in each year. Final question, because I got three seconds. Does DoD take this issue seriously, in your view, given what you just described? I believe that there are some elements in DOD that take it very seriously, Representative Connolly, but I think that the, the people that can make a difference don't give it enough attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, Mr. Wahlberg, for six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the panel for, uh, for being here. Uh, Mr. Swellenbach, uh, you um, cut short your descriptions uh, or stories. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you a little, little further opportunity to tell us some of those stories. I mean, you talked about the Nepalis um, who, who were uh, captured and, and uh, ultimately uh, murdered. I guess we use that term, uh, but uh, also the fact that one of them was decapitated and the rest were murdered later on. Uh, tell us a few more stories, because uh, a panel like this, its purpose is to get the, the answers and, and problems, but I think it's also to give voice to those who have no voice. Uh, the third example that I wasn't able to uh, recount in my oral earlier was uh, a case of alleged labor contracting uh, or labor trafficking in Iraq uh, with a DOD subcontractor or a State Department subcontractor that was involved in building the new embassy compound in Baghdad. The multinational force Iraq Inspector General did look into these allegations that First Kuwaiti was doing this. And according to a Inspector General uh, memorandum from 2007, they stated that several laborers reported that fraudulent, fraudulent hiring practices were used during their recruitment. They stated the promises made in the terms of the original contracts presented to them in their country of origin were inconsistent with the actual conditions regarding lower pay, longer hours, no days off of their employment in Iraq. The memo also details debt bondage that some of these laborers faced. Uh, a large majority of the workers from the Indian subcontinent incurred recruiting fees of up to one year's salary, which far exceeded the le legal limits of the countries where the recruitment took place. And in some extreme examples, third country national workers relinquished all pay, all pay, for between nine to 12 months of labor. And if that isn't indentured servitude, I don't know what is. Uh, but that was the third example. And that was in violation of, of the, the country of origin. That yeah. Yeah, they, they could not charge recruitment fees, but, but the labor brokers did anyways, and the laborers signed up with the belief that they would be making more pay when they eventually got to the country where they were going to do the work. And they often believe they are not going to Iraq, they are going to Dubai or some other non-war zone country. How difficult it is, is it to, um, to investigate human trafficking allegations? 
well, if, if, if you don't talk to the victims, it's, it can be very difficult. And that's one problem I've seen in a few of these investigations is the victims say they were not interviewed by U.S. government investigators. And so that's, that's, a, that's a basic principle of, 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 of criminal investigation is you want to talk to the victim. I mean, they're a key witness. So it's, 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 uh, it's not difficult if you can talk to the witness, but if you choose not to talk to the witness. I, I don't want to minimize the difficulty of these investigations. They span continents. Um, there's often a complex chain of subcontractors and labor brokers and recruitment companies. And sometimes I also think the investigators sometimes take a, uh, use a narrow lens when they look at uh, a potential crime. Uh, they don't look at you know, the, the procurement fraud elements of trafficking violations and, and, and that I think they would be wise to do so. Uh, if I might, Representative Walber, I also yes. say that it isn't that difficult if you really take an interest in it. Uh, my colleague Sindhu PK and I recently interviewed a dozen victims in the south of India in Chennai, and we interviewed many, many victims on the ground in Iraq. The problem is, and one of the problems with the DODIG report, when you read about the people they interviewed, they never spoke to a victim. They spoke to government personnel. They said they even spoke to some of the management of the contractors. But not the victims. But never the victims. And the victims also need to be protected because we've had situations when we'd speak to a victim and the next day they're on a plane home. And in fact, we interviewed these dozen men in Chennai this summer. That's exactly what all of them said. They knew they couldn't speak to an American because if they did, they'd be put on a plane home, which meant they're no job. They still owed the loan shark and some very serious consequences for them. And, and they, don't, they don't perceive that the DOD would be of any help or protection for them? One of the things that we found was echoed in Sarah Stillman's comments in the New Yorker, that if, please tell the American people, because if the American people know what's going on here, they will help us. And we had heard that several times in our interviews. They believe that if the American people know what, how they're being treated, that we would help them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Eisenberg, uh, what needs to happen to increase oversight and enforcement? Well, I'd say that somebody within the uh, hierarchy of the various executive departments needs to emphasize that this is a real problem. As an example, the person responsible for bringing to my attention at considerable cost to themselves uh, what happened with Najla had originally tried contacting the U.S. government directly. That person had sent letters and emails to Department of Justice, Department of Defense, USAID, Department of State. Um, it was not until with this, no results, no results, ex except that earlier this year, that person finally got uh, contacted uh, initially via email. More than ten months later. Uh, after that person had originally contacted that agency to say we're in receipt of your email and we'd like to talk to you more about it. Uh, subsequent, since then, uh, there have been an interview of that person and phone calls, and presumably they are now looking into it. Um, where the status of that is, I don't know. But, but clearly, there's no excuse in my mind for a 10-month delay between receiving information and you know, getting back to that person. Yeah. I uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for uh, bringing light. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Walberg. Let me let me do a quick question as well. Um, on the investigation side, I, mm -hmm. I could fully appreciate this becomes quickly a he said she said where an investigator goes in, talks to a third country national who's terrified and says, "I paid five thousand dollars." There's a language barrier. There's all kinds of difficulty in the investigation there. Then the subcontractor or the prime. Either one says, no, we didn't do that. No, our recruiters don't. Can you find that recruiter? No, that's just some firm we used overseas. So validating these things, I would assume, would be incredibly difficult to do. The problem is just the frequency of the number of stories. You would assume someone would rise up and say, we have to start tracking this in some way. Right or wrong on that? Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, Chairman. Um, I mean, building an airtight criminal case can be quite difficult, especially when you have you know, that kind of he said, she said situ situation. But um, I think if there was, there's certainly, I think, plenty of opportunities to build criminal cases. And I think a high-profile criminal case that leads to success, successful conviction could have some sort of deterrent effect. Uh, and, and I do think, given the, the plethora of allegations out there, I think something could be made of, of at least some of those. Right. But you go back again to suspension and debarment does not have the same threshold. Exactly. Uh, you have a lower, you so have a lower, uh, at, at a minimum. So the, the, the tools and the options are out there to do something. 
The question is, are we doing anything other than saying it has to be included in the contract, which even then, through the statistics, even, even the basic statement of the FAR and that we don't do trafficking in persons, that is not always included in contracts. Yeah. As the DOD IG has found in some of its audits, uh, some of the contracts that need, you know, all the contracts need to have this right. clause, some, sometimes the clause is just missing. Uh, but you are absolutely right. Suspension and debarment could be a tool used to protect the government's interests, and it is not used enough. And right. Chairman Langford, I'm also, I would also mention it's not as difficult as it might appear at first. What the subcontract usually does is deny the representations made by the recruiter. One need only see who entered into the agreement with that recruiter to start their investigation. That's the person who has the responsibility. What we have found is oftentimes there is no paper trail. Right. The contractors say, well, we don't really have a written agreement with the recruiter. We'll say, well, how do you flow down the clauses then that are mandatory? And which goes to the whole suspension debarment. I think that it is difficult to prosecute these cases because of the jurisdictional issues and also the distance and language barriers. It isn't difficult to do a fact based debarment. Okay. Mr. Connolly, would you like to ask some questions as well? Well, it is exactly that area I wanted to ask you about, Mr. McMahon, because in listening again to your testimony, it seems to me that, uh, well, first of all, this is all about money. So, frankly, going after criminal prosecution may be ideally a good thing to do down the road. But what we need to do is change the incentive disincentive system, and it is all about money for recruiters, for the workers, the lure of that money, and for the subcontractors who are you know, getting paid by the United States government to the prime. But it seems to me that what the system you described in your 10 point sort of list, the, the weak link is the recruiting, potentially. Yeah. If we really want to go after this practice, requiring documentation, working with the host government at getting at deceptive practices, uh, laying out in more contractual terms exactly what is expected and exactly what is it going to cost and how we document that those payments are made or not made or they are exorbitant or they are not. Could you talk just a little bit about that? And what is the United States government doing in, back in the host country with those recruiters? I'd be glad to address that, Representative Connolly. One of the things that the U.S. government can do is mandate in the contract that every worker receive a copy of their contract prior to departing their host nation in a language that they understand, in their host nation language. It doesn't cost anyone anything. Because you hit it upon the head, the crux of this is deceptive recruiting. It's all deceptive recruiting about where they're going to work, how much money they're going to make, paying the commission. Another thing that they could do is make the subcontractor required to compensate that individual one day after they depart their host nation. The men we talk to languish for months in warehouses until they can be pulled off the shelf like a widget and then a supply item put into the supply system. They get no money, only subsistence food. They are not making payments to their loan sharks or anything like that. So you could make the subcontractor require to be responsible and also make sure that these recruiting agreements are in writing. Very few people we talk to ever had a contract. And uh, so those few simple steps would mitigate this significantly. And, and it has, has, to your knowledge, has there been such discussion with DOD and in imposing such requirements so that we can try to get our arms around deceptive recruiting practices? Uh, my colleague and I have forwarded a summary, a four-page memorandum on solicitation strategies and contract provisions that can be used. We forward it to DOD and Department of State for consideration. When? To Department of State about 15 months ago and to the Department of Defense maybe about six or eight months ago. And the reaction? We have worked with the chief of the CTIPS operation, DOD, and I believe they are committed to this. And we recently spoke at a conference, a CTIPS conference in August on the topic. You have spoken about it at a conference? Yes, sir. But there has been no formal response in 15 months to your State Department memo or in six months to your DOD memo? Uh, not to the State Department at all, sir. <sighs> um, when, let me ask this question uh, again on the recruiting side. Obviously, when a recruiter, it is one thing to engage in deceptive practices on the financial end. But the purpose of your labor is a different matter. If I am recruiting and I tell you you are going to go to a five-star hotel, uh, 
and you're going to serve fancy dancy clientele and you're going to be rich from the tips alone. And instead, actually, I'm actually luring you into a prostitution ring where you're serving whoever in Iraq or some other war zone. Uh, presumably, somebody at the receiving end knows full well what I'm doing, and so do I. The only person deceived is the poor victim. Yes. Um, what has been done to try to crack down on that practice, uh, that aspect of human trafficking? To my knowledge, Representative Connolly, nothing's been done. I spoke at a conference in 2007 specifically entitled Things That Government Contractors Can Do to Mitigate Trafficking. And there was a uh, major contractor that spoke ahead of me who was Vice President of Contracting, uh, currently one of the log cap contractors. His response when he was asked what they were doing to mitigate trafficking, he said, we have no privity of contract with the employees of the subcontractor, therefore we're taking no action. It's not our responsibility. So I think what we see is all the way down the trafficking chain, people disavow the responsibility for it. I've I, I got to say, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just stunned at this testimony. I mean, stunned that in the name of the American people, these practices have been allowed and we've turned a blind eye to them for either bureaucratic reasons or because we've got uh, what we consider to be more important parts of the mission. And it seems to me that whatever it is we're fighting for in Iraq and Afghanistan, under the banner of our flag, allowing these practices compromises it all. It couldn't be more antithetical to American values, what you're describing. I look forward to the testimony of the next panel. As do I. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here as part of this first panel. With that, we'll take a short recess to reset for panel number two.